Your Bible has quite a bit of misogynistic language in it. Did you know that the Ten Commandments are for men? Did you know that? Read the book. Your neighbor's wife is the same as his enslaved people, the same as his ox, the same as his donkey, or other things that belong to him. Women are property. I know several sisters that are actually pastors of churches. Well, how does that work? Doesn't your book say that you should sit down and shut up? You have to understand that the Tom who have actually had control of that book for 2,000 years. And they've done with it what they pleased. You begin this lecture criticizing the Bible, stressing that it has been controlled by white people or the Tom who, as you call them, for 2,000 years. Yet you yourself constantly reference books, translations, photographs, and tour museums controlled by the Tom who to understand and educate others about Kemet. This is a blatant double standard, and it gets you a shot right out the gate. So that what you need to do, African, is re-Africanize your tradition. Specifically, its patriarchal, misogynistic bent is not African. Yet you never produce a single shred of evidence proving that African tradition was in fact non-misogynistic. This is known as deflection, and it earns you another shot. So that what you need to do, African, is re-Africanize your tradition. Specifically, its patriarchal, misogynistic bent is not African. This is false. The patriarchal, misogynistic bent is African, comedic even. And I will show you this again and again throughout this video. So I want you to take a look, for example, at something that this particular brother from ISUPK General said. General Hyman is his yeah. name? General Hyman. I want you to take a look at General something Hyman. he said. He says that he tells the cop that this woman is his B. And in doing that, what does he do? He gets the respect of the cop and the respect of his wife because he said this is his B. He says he's a man of God because he did that. I'm going to even tell you that to some degree, it may be even a little unfair to chastise him alone with this. Because some of the reason why he has this bizarre, disrespectful approach to women is because it's in your book. It's in the Bible. General Mahiman's disrespect for women, particularly calling them the B word, does not stem from the Bible. Nowhere in the scriptures are men instructed or encouraged to verbally abuse women. So you're lying, Jabari, and lying on the Bible is an automatic 10 shots. Your Bible has quite a bit of misogynistic language in it. First of all, understand that in Exodus 2017 and Deuteronomy 521, you're going to see something that essentially says, you shall not cover your neighbor's house. You should not cover your neighbor's wife or his male slave, his female slave, his ox, his donkey, or anything that which belongs to your neighbor. First of all, you're going to recognize that this is essentially the Decalogue. This is, the ten, this is from the Ten Commandments. So understand that what is being said here is that women are property. For someone who claims to be a comedic priest, you sure don't seem to know much about comedic culture. If you did, you would know that the ideal of women being the property of their husbands was also the case in ancient Kemet. Let's take the maxims of Patahotep, for example. This collection of maxims provides guidelines for conduct as well as instructions on morals and living right, according to Ma'at. We'll be reading from the literature of ancient Egypt, an anthology of stories, instructions, stele, autobiographies, and poetry, third edition. You can find this book on Amazon. This is what it says in Prose 10.9. Be gracious to your wife in accordance with what is fair. Feed her well. Put clothes on her back. Ointment is the balm for her body. Rejoice her heart all the days of your life, for she is a profitable field for her Lord. Notice that Patahotep refers to a woman's husband as her Lord. The word in the Medunether translated Lord in this maxim is Neb, which means Lord, Master, Owner, Husband. And keep in mind that Patahotep is speaking in a general sense, meaning women being the property of their husbands was the rule of the day in Egyptian culture. 
And before you try to claim that this was Patahotep's personal view of women, he himself declares in Prose 5.3, Permit your humble servant to appoint a staff of old age. Let my son be allowed to succeed to my position. To that end, I will instruct him in the decisions of the judges, the wisdom of those who have lived in earlier ages, those who hearkened to the gods. So Patahotep was claiming that his maxims were the teachings of his ancestors, who in turn learned them from the gods, or Neturu, as you would call them. Therefore, Patahotep was undeniably claiming that his teachings came by inspiration of the Neturu themselves. Also, you yourself said in another video concerning the maxims of Patahotep. Our bit of comedic wisdom comes to us from uh, the maxims written by Patahotep. And I find it interesting that this text is also the world's oldest discovered book. So by that logic, that would make Egypt the world's oldest civilization to consider the wife to be the property of the husband. And aren't you married, Jabari? If you truly subscribe to comedic culture, that would make you a neb. And given that this word means owner, what do you suppose you became the owner of when you got married? Here's a hint. Did you know that the Ten Commandments are for men? Did you know that? Read the book. No, you need to read the book. The Ten Commandments are stated in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, as you yourself point out. But what you didn't read is Deuteronomy 5 and 1, where Moses plainly tells the Hebrews that the Ten Commandments were written for all of them to follow, not just the men. If you're going to criticize Bible passages, at least start at verse 1 to get some context. Five shots. Also, do you seriously believe that thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery only applied to men? Sweet Clyde, laugh derisively at him. <laughs> Let's go further. In the Bible, it says that women should have no voice. This one comes from Timothy. Um, I'm sorry. Um, uh, First Timothy from uh, 9 to 15. It says, women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. In other words, men can dress however they like in many ways in expensive clothing, but women should be modest. Okay, some of you don't necessarily see a problem with that, but it goes deeper. I have a problem with it because it, it tells you that women are, are in a second level. They're not as important as men. You're twisting this verse way out of context. Paul was in no way diminishing the importance of women in this verse. He never flat out said that women can't wear these things. He was simply telling women that they should be known first and foremost for their good works instead of elaborate hairstyles, flashy jewelry, or extravagant clothing. In other words, Paul was saying that Christian women should seek a beauty that's godly, not godly. You completely missed the point. But then, when it comes to the Bible, you always do. But let's go further. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. In other words, when you see women who are Christian, women who are Hebrew Israelites, women who are in any of the Abrahamic traditions, if they're reading this, they should know that the Bible says they should shut up. Actually, what they should know is that you're, once again, misunderstanding the text. What you fail to realize is that these verses must be viewed in their proper historical and geographical context to gain their true meaning. During the first century, the worship of the goddess Artemis was prevalent in Ephesus. This false teaching was being pushed by women in the Ephesian church and causing believers to sway from the true faith. In response to this, Paul prohibited women in that church at that time from teaching and assuming authority over men. This had nothing to do with misogyny. Paul was simply addressing a specific problem in a specific church in which unruly women who had turned from the faith played a leading role. This is why Paul also decreed that the women in that church learn quietly and submissively. This is called Bible hermeneutics, Jabari. Look into it. And what about the numerous women in the Bible who clearly had a voice? 
You know, women like Deborah and Hulda, who were both prophets. Also Anna, another woman prophet, and Priscilla, who Paul himself identifies as his fellow laborer in Christ. Then there's Phoebe, who Paul refers to as a deaconess, a title of leadership, bro. Not to mention the four daughters of Philip the Evangelist, who were all the prophets. No man in the Bible ever told these women to shut up. And you can't claim they were exceptions to the rule, because the Bible never says or implies that these women having a voice was going against the norm. I also find it incredibly disingenuous how you take issue with the Bible for its alleged misogynistic teachings, but have zero complaints about the misogyny in comedic tradition. For this hypocrisy, you get five shots for every case of misogyny I point out in comedic literature. We'll start with the instruction of Ankhshashanki. His authorship is attributed to Ankhshashanki, a priest of Ra at Heliopolis. This ancient Egyptian papyrus consists of a series of maxims and advice similar to the Bible's book of Proverbs. Prose 25.5 says, Do not take a woman's words to your heart, which means don't seriously consider what a woman says, nor follow her advice. Yeah, nothing misogynistic about this, right Jabari? Unk Shashanki also said, A woman is a blight who does not quit the tree without having destroyed it. So according to this Egyptian priest, a woman is a blight that doesn't stop until the tree is destroyed. A blight is a disease that withers and kills plants. Is this how we're supposed to view our women, Jabari? As a disease? And yet, Anshashanki had more misogynistic advice to give. In Prose 13.15, he says, Do not open your heart to your wife. What you have said to her belongs to the street. This is saying that a man should not reveal his personal thoughts to his wife because she'll tell everyone in the streets. In other words, wives gossip. Is this what you think of your wife, Jabari? Akshashanki further says in Prose 13.20, The teaching of a woman is like a sack of sand with its side split open. Unkshashanki said that teaching women is like putting sand in a sack with a hole in it. Plainly put, he was saying there's no point in teaching women. They don't learn. Doesn't your wife have a doctorate degree, Jabari? I would love to hear her thoughts on this maxim. Unkshashanki continues saying her savings are stolen property. So the Egyptian priest declared that a woman's savings are stolen property. I'm pretty sure your wife has some kind of savings, Jabari. Do you think they're stolen? Unkshashanki concludes this misogynistic maxim saying, What she will do with her husband today, she does with another man tomorrow. Unkshashanki was saying that women are not loyal. Hmm, I know I've heard this somewhere before. These hoes ain't loyal. And keep in mind that the Egyptian sage is speaking in a general sense, which means this is how he viewed all wives. Are African men not to trust their wives, Jabari? Do you not trust your wife? Still, Unkshashanki had more sagely advice on how to deal with wives. He states in Prose 12.10, Let your wife look at your property. Do not trust her with it. So our wives can look at the things we own, but we are not to trust them with those things. And notice that Unkshashanki considers a married man's property to still be his and his alone. Unkshashanki even says, Do not trust her with her food and clothing allowance for a single year. This is saying, do not trust your wife even for a single year to properly budget her own food and clothing expenses. In other words, wives are bad with money. Do you agree with this, Jabari? Should African men not trust their wives with finances? And still, Anshashanki's misogynistic views go deeper. In Prose 2020, he states, The waste of a woman is in not knowing her carnally. Knowing a woman carnally means knowing her sexually. So Unkshashanki is saying that a woman who doesn't have sex with you is a waste. She's worthless. This is the literal definition of a sex object. And remember, Unkshashanki wasn't just some random guy in ancient Egypt spouting sentiments. 
He was a priest, which means to the ancient Egyptians, his words were essentially the words of the Neturu themselves. So you can't say his misogynistic views were merely his own. So Jabari, should African men view their women as sex objects? Let's take another look at the maxims of Patahotep. In Prose 1011, the Egyptian vizier teaches concerning wives, but keep her far away from power. Control her, for her eye is quick and sharp. Watch her carefully, for thus you will cause her to remain long in your house. In other words, keep your eyes in check, brothers. Watch them closely. If you do these things, they'll stay with you for a long time. And I'm aware that this maxim has already been brought to your attention, which is why you already had a rebuttal prepared when Sa Netter questioned you about it during your debate with Pastor Bennett. Jabari, let me ask you a question. Um, Absolutely. Is it true that Patar Hotep says to control your woman also? Does Patar also no. tell you to control no. your woman? I cannot say this so strongly. Okay. There are a few people in the Hebrew Israelite community that read one line and didn't read the whole paragraph. In okay. fact, they read one translation and didn't read at least two or three translations. The line actually says that your woman's eye is like a storm when she's angry with you. And it says, keep her from power. So they're trying to say that it means that women should not be powerful. But you should understand that almost every other translation says, keep her from the judge. In other words, if your woman is angry with you, she's going to end your relationship. By the way, that quote continues by saying to be kind to her and to rub her with oil so that she may be pleasant. Oh, That's what it says. Got you. Beautiful. They, they continue to misrepresent that key. Once again, you show a total lack of intellectual honesty. And since you seem to think that reading multiple translations of this maxim strengthens your argument, here are four of the oldest translations of this maxim from four reputable Egyptologists. We'll start with Richard Bruce Parkinson's translation. It reads, Remove her from power. Suppress her. When she sees anything, her eye is a storm wind to her. Restraining her is how to make her remain in your house. Next, we'll examine Raymond Oliver Faulkner's translation. Neither judge her nor raise her to a position of power. Her eye is a storm wind when she sees. Soothe her heart with what has accrued to you. It means that she will continue to dwell in your house. Adolf Ehrman's translation states, Gladden her heart so long as she liveth. She is a goodly field for her lord. Hold her back from getting the mastery and the like. Lastly, Miriam Lichtheim's translation says, Gladden her heart as long as you live. She is a fertile field for her lord. Do not contend with her in court. Keep her from power. Restrain her. Her eye is her storm when she gazes. Thus will you make her stay in your house. So all four of these certified Egyptologists concurred that this maxim declares men should control their wives and keep them from power. I'm starting to doubt you've read multiple translations of this maxim. Well, let's go further. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. The entire damnation of humanity is blamed on women. It actually says here that Eve was the one that was deceived. And so that's why she's being punished. You really like reading your own ideas into the scriptures, don't you? Paul is not blaming Eve for mankind's condemnation in 1 Timothy 2 and 14. In fact, Paul stresses in Romans 5, 12 through 17, that it was Adam's sin that led to the fall of humanity. This is Christianity 101. How can you not know this? It actually says here that Eve was the one that was deceived. And so that's why she's being punished. And how was she being punished? She's being punished with her regular menses. The Bible says that, sisters, when you have your menstrual pains, it's you are being punished for being deceived by the devil. What Bible are you reading? 1 Timothy 2 and 14 says nothing about menses. It also says nothing about women being 
punished with them due to Eve being deceived by the devil. Where are you even getting this from? You're just making stuff up and lying on the Bible. You know what? Forget it. Ten shots. This kind of stuff is misogynistic. This kind of stuff is reprehensible and should be challenged. Why are you not challenging men and women in the comedic community to take a stand against the misogyny in comedic tradition? Oh, now I get it. You only have a problem with misogyny if it's in the Bible. Gotcha. Guess what else, Jabari? Yes, Brother Sa. When they on their menstrual cycle, they also can't sleep in the same bed with their husband. <laughs> you know I was going there. They can't. <sighs> Sanetter, just... Just stay out of it. Who does that to their wife? Do you know who does that to their wife? Someone who is so enamored with the European that they don't even realize that they're enamored with the European. Because that's not how Africans work. That's not how we get down. Actually, this is exactly how Africans got down. Check out this citation from a book titled Lotus and Laurel Studies on Egyptian Language and Religion in Honor of Paul John Franson. This book was edited by Rune Njord and Kim Reholt, two leading authorities on Egyptology. It was compiled in celebration of Paul John Franson, who himself is a distinguished scholar of ancient Egyptian language and religion. You can find this book on Amazon. This is what it says on page 146. In Egypt, we know that menstruating women were secluded either at a special place away from the center of the village or, in later times, in a special room in the house. So women in ancient Egypt were separated during their menstrual cycles, just like the women in ancient Israel. Who does that to their wife? Do you know who does that to their wife? Someone who is so enamored with the European that they don't even realize that they're enamored with the European. So I guess the Egyptians were also so enamored with the European that they didn't even realize they were enamored with the European. This is not African. This is anti-African and is anti-woman. So by that logic, the ancient Egyptians were anti-African and anti-woman. Listen to what we hear here in Deuteronomy. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found. By the way, keep in mind, and they be found. I'm going to get back to that in a second. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. Women, the Bible says that you should be married to your rapist. That's what it says. It, it says, and they be found. So if you don't get caught, you off scot-free. Right. Damn. But if you get caught, you have to pay the, the woman's, the, the virgin's father 50 shekels for her. So that if you are raped, <laughs> you should be purchased by your rapist and become his wife. That's up stuff, y'all. I challenge you to explain this to me. I accept that challenge and will gladly explain it to you. These verses are not saying that women were required to marry their rapists. The reason you're making this claim is because when you read the words, lay hold on, you ignorantly assume it means in a forceful way. What's interesting is that when you claim this verse sanctions rape, you make it contradict the law in verse 25, prohibiting rape. Even more interesting is the fact that in this clear case of rape in verse 25, a completely different Hebrew word is used from the one in verse 28. The Hebrew word translated forces her in verse 25 is hazak, while the word translated lay hold on in verse 28 is tafaz. Though both of these words can be translated lay hold on, scholars of the Hebrew language will attest that tafaz does not carry the same connotation of force as hazak. This means that the woman in verse 28 was held or embraced, but not necessarily assaulted. And given how closely Hazak and Tafaz appear in these two successive laws, it's clear that these two distinct verbs are meant to convey two different circumstances. Secondly, you're completely ignorant of the legal terminology used in Mosaic law. As you pointed out, verse 28 says, and they be found. In Mosaic law, the words he be found are used to refer to a guilty person caught in the very act of sin. So when verse 28 says, and they be
be found, the implication is that both the man and the woman were guilty. This means the sex was consensual. Thirdly, notice how the law in verse 28 says nothing about the woman crying for help, unlike the previous laws concerning rape in verses 23 through 27. This further implies that the woman in verse 28 was a willing participant, not a victim. So again, this law did not require women to marry their rapists. It morally and financially obligated men to marry the women they had sex with. This is why verse 29 says the man had to pay the woman's father and could never divorce her. But because you refuse to read scriptures in context, you've actually taken a law that protected women from being used merely for sexual gratification and you've made it misogynistic. Again, Jabari, hermeneutics, look into it. Even in Genesis, by the way, it seems that women should regularly refer to their husbands as Lord. Imagine me going to tell my queen, <laughs> a beautiful, powerful African queen, that she needs to call me Lord in our house. She would say, Lord, take your things and go. That's what she would say. <laughs> and she would call me Lord while she kicks me out the house. Not if she was in ancient Egypt. As I already pointed out, the maxims of Patahotep revealed that women referring to their husbands as Lord was common practice in Egyptian culture. Your wife would have called you Lord and liked it, bro. She's not my property. She's not secondary to me. Yes, she is, if both of you truly live according to comedic tradition. In the African tradition, that is not how women occur. So is comedic tradition not African tradition then? I'm confused. If you are going to be a conscious member of this community and you are in still ensconced in the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, of Christianity, of Islam, you have to get away from this. And do what? Adopt the comedic tradition? It's there too. And the women in your tradition should be leading the charge against it. No, the women in your tradition who see this video need to lead a charge against you and tell you you're lying. Now, let's let me give you where I'm coming from on on from Genesis 18 12, 12, Genesis chapter 18 verse 12. It says, "Therefore Sarah laughed with herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, pleasure my lord, being old also." So she's actually saying that he should be known as her lord. That's what we're talking about here. This is a problem. Sarah is one of the most important women in the Bible, but she still has to call her husband Lord. <sighs> I already addressed this. Let's go further. A woman's vow to God can be nullified by her father or husband in Numbers chapter 30, verses 3 to 15. You mean that if your wife your daughter, your mother, makes a commitment to, with, between herself and her creator? Her husband or her father? Um, her husband or her father can nullify it? Her vows to the divine are only worth something as long as the man in her life says that they are. There you go again, taking a law that was instituted to protect women and making it misogynistic. As you pointed out, this law gave a woman's father or husband the power to cancel a vow she made to God. Now, if you actually read the Bible instead of constantly trying to find fault with it, you'd know that a vow to God was unbreakable. But this law gave women, and only women, an escape clause. This was highly beneficial as a careless vow to God could have dire consequences. Yet, this law made no such exceptions for men as stated in verse 2. How is this misogynistic? If anything, you should be complaining that this law is unfair to men. And then also we hear that in um, uh, Colossians 3, 18 to 19, and Ephesians 5, 22 to 25, that, w that women should submit to their husbands. Now, it is true that husbands are told to love their wives, but this is, this is uh, I, I've, I've argued with some Christians about this, and they say, well, husbands are told to love their wives. Yes, but women are told to submit to their husbands. That is not equal. Don't try to make that equal. If you're being told to submit to your husband, this is not an egalitarian society that respects women. True. 
These verses do instruct women to submit to their husbands. But what you didn't show the people is that Ephesians 5 and 21 first instructs all believers in general to submit to one another out of reverence for God. This verse is important because it shows that submission does not mean lack of respect as you foolishly claim. And then also we hear that in um, uh, Colossians 3, 18 to 19 and Ephesians 5, 22 to 25, that, wi that women should submit to their husbands. You left out the other part of Ephesians 5 and 25, which says, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. If you understood how Christ loved the church, then you'd understand that this verse is actually instructing husbands to reciprocate submission to their wives. First, Jesus said that he came to serve, not to be served, which was an act of submission. But how did Jesus serve the church? By taking care of the people and providing for them. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, plus many other acts of service. But Jesus' ultimate act of service to the church was giving his life for it. So just as the wife submits to her husband by accepting his God-given role as leader, so too does the husband submit to his wife by serving her every need and is even willing to die for her. And I know you'll say, but it still says the husband is the leader. That's not equal. True. But a higher role does not mean a higher value. Paul states in Galatians 3 and 28 that all believers, whether male or female, are one, meaning equal in Christ. You also mentioned Colossians 3 verses 18 and 19, but you only addressed verse 18. If you had read verse 19, you would have seen that it says husbands are not to mistreat their wives, the exact opposite of misogyny. Why didn't you touch on this verse? And then finally, let's even look at the non-canonical Gospel of Thomas. So there are several books that are not in the accepted canon of Christianity, but understand that in the Gospel of Thomas, it even says that um, women can be saved if they become men. And they're talking specifically about the most important woman in the Bible, Mary. So the only way that she should go into heaven is if she becomes a man. There are other, pro that, this is in the Gospel of Thomas. This Read isn't, again, this is not in the canonical Bible, I'm going to be clear. Okay. This is in the non-canonical Bible. But it's still part of the wellspring that Christians have drawn from to create their tradition. Where are you getting your information, Jabari? The non-canonical Gospel of Thomas was never popular in its day. The early church unanimously rejected it as inauthentic and deemed it heretical literature. So it was not part of the wellspring that Christians have drawn from to create their tradition. Stop lying. How about Lot's virgin daughters? When a raping mob, by the way, there are a lot of men who are in raping mobs in the Bible. There's something wrong when that's something that happens in your book a lot. A lot? There's only one incident of gang rape occurring in the entire Bible, and that's in Judges 19. The only other place gang rape is mentioned is Genesis 19, and it was an unsuccessful attempt. So, a lot is a bit of an exaggeration, bro. But as the raping mob comes to Lot's home, instead of raping the two visitors, guess what he does? He offers his virgin daughters. And he's supposed to be one of the sacred men in your tradition. He offers his virgin, da virgin daughters to a raping mob. Really? Really? Yes, really. But nowhere in the Bible is Lot ever praised for this, nor are Christians instructed to imitate his actions. The misconception here is thinking that just because the Bible says Lot was righteous, that means it endorses everything he did. But righteous does not mean perfect. Even holy men make mistakes, Jabari. How about let's go further? How about Noah's wives? You ever notice that Noah's, I'm sorry, Noah's son's wives. You ever notice that Noah's sons are named? We have their names as they are on the ark. It becomes clear that their wives are on the ark too, but we never get their names. Why not? Because they are less important than the men in the story. So what about all the times the wives of prominent men are mentioned by name in the Bible? like Abraham's wife, Sarah, or Moses' wife, Zipporah. 
And let's not forget the seven wives of David whose names are all listed in 1 Chronicles 3. What you're trying to do is create the false impression that the Bible considers women to be less important than men simply because it doesn't give the names of the wives of Noah's sons. Be serious, bro. And then finally, and perhaps this is the worst depiction of misogyny in the Bible, there's a story of the Levite. And the Levite actually has a concubine, a sex slave. The Egyptians had concubines too, Jabari. Who is so tormented by him that she flees to her father. And the Levite goes after her, and he and her father make a deal, and he is able to take her back into sexual slavery. What else happens? There's a point, once again, where there's a raping mob, and... um. He, he offers his, his, his host, I'm not going to go into the entire story, um, his host offers his virgin daughters, and the Levite offers his concubine, this woman who was in his sexual slave. Well, it seems like the raping mob doesn't take the daughters, but he does kick the concubine out for the raping mob. And it clearly says in the Bible that they rape her all night long, that all of the men know her. She is gang raped for hours. And in the morning when the Levite opens the door, where does he find her? He finds her. It's not clear if she's alive or not, but he finds her with her hands on the doorstep. In this, in this story in the Bible, we don't hear God coming to her rescue. We don't hear the, Le Le the Levite being struck down because of this evil thing that he does to this woman who is his sexual slave. What happens? He takes the woman, he cuts her into pieces, and parades the portions of her body around the town. True, but neither do we read anywhere in this story that this Levite's barbaric actions were condoned. In fact, we are told that when people saw what this Levite had done, they were utterly horrified. The problem is you don't know the difference between what the Bible recommends and what it merely records. To make matters worse, you left out the part of the story that tells how the tribes of Israel held a council and demanded that the Benjamites hand over the men who raped the concubine so they could be executed. You also failed to mention that when the Benjamites refused to give up these men, civil war broke out in which thousands of Benjamites were massacred and their cities burned. This story alone should be a clear indication to anyone that the Hebrews despised rape. Yet you claim the Bible says women should marry their rapists. You really need to look into this Bible hermeneutics thing. I know that I, I spit a little venom here because it upsets me. An apt choice of words considering the Bible metaphorically describes people who speak lies as having venom under their lips. But I really want to engage in a real conversation on how this can change. The way you carry on like you're uber anti-misogynistic while representing Kemet, a tradition deeply rooted in misogyny, is oxymoronic and demonstrates a complete lack of scholarship. This is the guy you refer to as the Floyd Mayweather of consciousness, Sonnetter? If the real Floyd Mayweather knew you were disrespecting his name like this, he'd probably...